All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the nuts and bolts of Web.io. Um, I'm excited to have you all here for this workshop. Um, and um, I'm really looking forward for the next two hours um, learning everything about Web.io and um, uh, how to use the framework and how you, you know, build up your test automation framework from zero to infinity. Before we get into the uh, nuts and bolts, uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Christian. I'm a software engineer in the open source program office at Source Labs, where I work on various of open source projects that are related to testing and test automation. Um, I'm also helping out in various of ways to help the company to be good open source citizen externally as well as internally. And I try to support and help out the uh, W3C working group in uh, creating the new spec for the web term protocol. Our agenda for today looks as follows. Uh, we have an introductory part, uh, which is going to be a presentation of me um, that I give on Web.io. Um, and there will be a hot hands on workshop um, where uh, you can already go on the website at github.com slash Christian minus Broman slash Web.io minus hands on. Um, where we have a variety of tasks um, that you can follow along uh, that help you to understand the framework um, and um, you know, the nits and bits uh, of it. If you have already experience with Rep.io, uh, you can skip the presentation part, and, you know, have it in the background and already start working on the workshop. Uh, I think there's enough material that you know, can, can keep you busy for the next couple of hours. Um, so if you're already familiar with uh, WebDevRel, if you already heard the presentation or seen the presentation, feel free to just skip and work on the workshop. And we will come back to it um, after the presentation, where I can then help individual people out in the chat, um, uh, where we also have a couple of members of the WebDevRel project um, with questions and answers. So let me get started with introducing WebDevRel for everyone who has not used it so far. And before we and if uh, before we want to do that, I want to step, take a step, uh, take e take even one more step back, and want to start with explaining the web driver protocol in general. The web driver protocol is a remote control interface that enables introspection and control of user agents. What does it mean? Um, there are several um, words that are important here. First off, it says it's a remote control interface. That means that it is uh, some sort of contract that allows you to uh, you know, do certain things with that protocol. Then this protocol enables an introspection um, and control, uh, which means this interface uh, that the web driver describes allows you to introspect and control uh, that user, um, um, that something. And at the end, it says the introspection and control of a an user agent. And that means a user agent can be everything that has a display and that can be used by a user. That is not only a browser that you would normally use. It can be everything from uh, you know, a console, a PlayStation, a, a phone, a, a tablet. Anything that can be used by a user um, can be controlled, theoretically. So the, the way how this web protocol looks like is as follows. We have a set of REST endpoints that allow you to control and introspect uh, a browser. You have. Uh, um, REST endpoints that allow you to create a browser session. Uh, we have REST endpoints that allow you to visit a specific URL and um, to do various other things. To trigger this action in the browser, uh, you will have to call this URL. And the reason why this was created this way is it allowed everyone with any programming language that you know, supports the sending HTTP requests to implement the web driver protocol. And therefore, we have these days uh, a Selenium package um, for almost all uh, languages that there are out there. So the WebTower protocol is W3C standards for browser automation. And this is really important. All browser vendors are working together in building out the standard for automating a browser. That means that every time you automate a browser, you will have the same results running the click command on Chrome or running the click command on Safari. It will be always the same. You might have heard, on, um, you might have heard about the JSON wire protocol before, which was the predecessor um, that now, since we have a W3C standard, is not valid anymore. 
the Web Token Protocol is not Selenium. Uh, back in the days where the Selenium project really contained all the drivers and all the implementations of these drivers, pretty much Selenium was all what is for browser automation. But these days, it is nicely abstracted into an external protocol that is um, developed by a standard organization. And then there are a variety of implementation implementers um, that have implemented a framework on top of WebDriver, which is, for instance, Selenium or WebDriver.io. As I mentioned before, it defines a REST interface, so you can use and implement this protocol for all languages. And it's a common denominator currently for cross-browser automation. Um, you might have heard about Appium, which extends the WebTower protocol for allowing mobile commands. But the WebTower protocol itself, as it is right now, is focused on browser automation. And as I mentioned, it can be used with all languages. The setup that you usually would have if you run a test with the WebDriver protocol is that you would have a simple test script or you know, um, uh, yeah, a test script or an automation script uh, that you have written with Selenium or other WebDriver-based uh, web uh, frameworks like WebDriver.io. Um, and this framework would then send HTTP requests to something called a driver. Um, there's today almost for every browser a driver uh, that allows to control and introspect the browser. It works similarly for mobile, where we have Appium that allows you and simplify the mobile automation across uh, iOS and Android. The drivers then itself, who are, which are developed by the browser vendors, have all the knowledge to trigger a natural event in the uh, browser, which is different to tools like Cypress that only can emulate these events. So as I mentioned, you can literally um, you know, automate every user agent. Um, one of my projects in the past was to automate a web application on a smart TV using Appium, uh, which you can see here in this video. So you can technically, if you have a driver, implement the protocol for that specific you know, IoT device and have WebDriver uh, be able to automate it. You know, for cloud-based vendors like Sauce Labs, um, their value proposition is easy, right? Um, instead of you know, having to set up all these browser drivers uh, for you and having to keep up with the browser updates, uh, there's a, these browser vendors that just do this for you and they provide you one HTTP endpoint uh, where you can just create a session for a mobile device or a browser as you wish. And they provide you with useful additional information like screenshots, uh, logs, and performance information. Let's get to WebDriver in more detail and start with the really key features of the framework. One of them I want to point out first is the easy test setup. WebDriver provides a configuration wizard that walks you through a common setup um, step um, to create your configuration file. Uh, this allows you to simply get to start, uh, up and running uh, quickly with just a matter of seconds. It also provides a various of services that allow you to deep integrate into third party vendors like AppTools for visual testing, um, where services enhance the browser functionality and the browser interface to just simply interact uh, with a third party vendor. Another example for that is source, the source uh, service that just simply allows you to uh, start this job on Source Labs uh, with just a, some configuration in your config file. What's also great is that we have a lot of tutorials and learn material. Um, there's a website called learn.web.io where you can currently find a lot of videos for free um, to watch and learn. But there's also a, a, a channel uh, built by one of our uh, team members, Kevin Lamping, uh, who has created so many great um, videos uh, on WebDriver.io. And there's others, um, uh, other contributors that have a lot of WebDriver.io uh, material as well. One, one additional really well awesome thing about WebDriver.io is the community. Uh, we have currently almost 6,000 people in our support chat, which help each other out on a daily basis. So if you have a problem using WebDriver, if you run into a bug, uh, you can always find your help there. And last but not least, WebDriver as a project is not owned by a company. It's owned by the OpenJS Foundation. 
that allows us to, um, this foundation helps us to, you know, scale the project in a healthy manner, uh, create, get new collaborator, collaborators on board, and, you know, work together with projects like Node.js, um, Webpack, Express, or AMP um, to commonly uh, improve ourselves um, throughout the projects. WebDevil can essentially be used in three different modes. Um, there is the bare metal mode, I would call it, uh, the standalone mode, and the WDAO test runner mode. The, the, the reason behind these three different layers is because we wanted to make automating a browser or mobile device as modular as possible. With the bare metal mode um, you, um, that you can use with the WebDriver NPM package, you pretty much get direct access to the WebDriver protocol. It exposes all the, um, all the methods that the WebDriver protocol uh, provides as an interface and allows you to just you know, use the protocol in a programmable fashion. The standalone mode then enhances that functionality by creating a bunch of commands on top of it that help you to do simple interaction and common testing interactions with your application on the test. And last but not least, the WDAO test runner then provides you in test, a test aspect uh, to everything around uh, browser automation. So you can run, you can automate a browser and test certain conditions in it. Here's, example, here's an example using the bare metal web driver package um, where you have a navigate to command, a find element command, and you see there, if, if you find an element, you need to know what the protocol returns in order to access, uh, for instance, here, the element ID. And this is sometimes you know, not useful if you want, want to write uh, extensive, an extensive test suite because um, you want, don't want to deal with low-level protocol uh, primitives. Um, but this WebDriver protocol, uh, this WebDriver package definitely helps you if you want to build a new framework that looks a little bit different than WebDevO um, um, uh, for your community. Uh, there are examples like Spectron, who is a test framework for Electron uh, that has used uh, this capability. The WebDevO project, as I mentioned before, makes interacting with the browser a little bit more easier. Um, as you can see here, the commands are a little bit more shorter, and there is something like an element object where you have to fetch an element to uh, explicitly call element-specific uh, commands on it. And then last but not least, there's a test runner mode where you can run WebDriver.io commands in a test concept, uh, context uh, where you have an it block uh, that allows you to assert the amount of elements that you find on the page or where you can receive a click, uh, where you can receive a text of a certain element and assert against that. Since version 6, we now have a custom assertion library that is built on top of expect. Uh, so you can, so you can have, so you already have an assertion uh, library integrated uh, and ready to use. To get started with the WDO test runner, which I think is the common, uh, common usage of the WebDriver framework, is by installing the add WDO CLI package, which brings you all the um, all the capabilities in your command line interface. We have a config command uh, that helps you to configure a WDAO config file. We allow you to install services and reporters into your config file automatically. We have a REPL uh, functionality and, uh, of course, a run uh, command that allows you to run the test suite. Everything around the W test runner goes along goes with the config file that you use to run your test specs. This config file exposes all configurations and options for your specific test run. These configuration can include things like the specs that you want to run, uh, which specs you want to include, uh, the you know, concurrency uh, that you run, want to run your test in, uh, the capabilities that you want to run your test in, and all these things. It is really important if you build out a large test suite that you have multiple configuration files for different environments. For your development workflow, you, don't, you want to specifically run just one browser like Chrome uh, to make sure that your end-to-end -end test pass.
But for staging or production tests, you might want to tweak that configuration a little bit uh, so you run it on more browser to create, get more coverage. And the really you know, um, best case scenario that you can do is you, have, you create a common WDAO config file and you enhance that config file in a new config file. As you can see here, uh, I have a WDIO source.config file, which I use for my staging and production tests, uh, where I you know, run multiple capabilities and where I include the source service, which I don't need for development purposes. Test frameworks that are supported with WebDriver are Mocker, Cucumber, Jasmine, and Jest. Jest has a little asterisk in there because we don't have Jest integrated itself. But the test that you run with Jasmine um, and our uh, assertion library look like Jest's tests. So next to the framework, frameworks that we support, we always have various of reporters that you can use, like spec, dot, allure, j, unit, team, city, tab, mock or awesome. Um, we have, and we have a bunch of services that allow you to integrate with other uh, third party vendors or um, services um, like Sauce, Appium. We have a plugin that allows you to start a static server to, um, to you know, um, serve your web app. Uh, we have uh, services for drivers and Selenium standalone server and, and a lot of more. And you can, with the reporters and services, can create your test uh, setup really individually that is suited for your needs. What services are doing are essentially they are allowing you to you know, introspect the life cycle of a test. And they allow you to create a bunch of hooks for uh, specific scenarios or specific lifecycle events, um, like before a session starts, before a test starts, before a suit starts, or before a command starts, um, uh, as well as after all that. And it allows you to do asynchronous operation on top of it. That allows us to start servers, or start a MySQL database if we need to, whenever we, um, you know, we need it. Um, and this is really a nice way to encapsulate um, configurations and com encapsulate complexity out of the configuration file, uh, which makes it really plug and, play, uh, plug and playable. A lot of these services already exist on NPM, and there's a big community that creates uh, services for you. Uh, but you can also create your custom services uh, along the way. As an example, uh, I want to look into the w, uh, w DevTools service, which I really like, because it allows you to, do, to run Chrome DevTools protocol commands uh, while running tests on Chrome. And the way, way how it works is you have a web driver session as normal uh, using the Chrome driver uh, binary. And um, at the same time with that service, you can run a CDP command and, for instance, listen to network logs or uh, do various other things that the Chrome DevTools protocol provides you. And for that, I want to show an example. Uh, so you see here my IDE, hopefully. And um, I have an example in the directory where I have a test that you know, enables the network. It runs a CDP command to enable the network interface in Chrome DevTools, and then literally literally just listens to events um, that is happening in Chrome. So what I do here is I open the Google uh, website, and at the same time, I listen to whatever requests have been loaded. And you can see uh, nicely, the first two commands are based on the Chrome DevTools protocol, while the second is the Reptilbug protocol. And they can nicely work uh, together. So let me get up my uh, console. Now, one second. Oh, no. Yeah. Well, this way, if we do it. There we go. So now I'm having opened my terminal. I go into the example folder um, for DevTools, and I'm going to run um, the service with that specific network test. So what's happening now is that there's a Chrome driver running, opening Chrome for me, going on the chrome.com page. And it just opens it, closes it immediately. But you can see here in the console logs, you see all the network commands that have been intercepted 
And you know, you can based on that, you know, have tests that check that if certain URLs have been called, if a certain request has been made, um, and a bunch of things more um, that you can do with the Chrome DevTools protocol command. Going back to the slides. There are, of course, more features. Um, we have a bunch of uh, um, nice selector strategy uh, extractions that make it really simple to fetch elements. Um, you can, of course, use uh, with the simple dollar sign uh, command, uh, fetch um, CSS selectors. Uh, you can, by starting with two uh, uh, slashes, you can start use an XPath. Um, we have ways, if you start with an equal sign, we look for a link with that specific text. But you can also just look for any HTML element that has a specific test, text or contains a specific text. So that really makes it simple to you know, find the element that you want to interact with. We even go a little bit more deeper, where we want to support native frameworks, um, as many of people you know, use, like React, uh, where we currently have a React dollar sign uh, command that allows you to fetch elements from a React application based on their component name and um, their state and their properties, which is really useful. And we have also uh, a lot of selector strategies for mobile. Um, where you can you know, select specific iOS um, selectors or Android selectors using the UI Automator framework, um, as well as allowing you to simply access the accessibility ID with a tilde sign. Another nice feature is the custom commands. WebDriver is extendable. You can create uh, as, much as, new command, as much new commands as you need to. Uh, so this is an example is actually from a real project that I had at SAUCE. Uh, where I wanted to you know, use or interact with the REST uh, interface without having to do anything with the browser. So I created a custom command that would do a post um, for me uh, to delete a specific user. And in my test, I could just call this command in a synchronous fashion, um, which, makes it really, which made it really simple for me to stop users and you know, um, just test the specific thing that I want to. WebDriver has the concept of multi-remotes. Um, so usually, you have one single browser and one test file um, where the browser just follows the instructions that are in your test file, and you get the results. But there are scenarios where you need multiple user agents to test a certain scenario. If you have applications that have a, tech, a, a chat application, or if you want to test a WebRTC uh, application where you need two parties to actually work with the app, you can use the multi remote test. And that allows you to control multiple environments at the same time in one single test. Before we go deeper, um, let's go, let's, let's do a little theory about, uh, let's learn a little bit about the page object model. You probably already have heard about it, and it's a really popular um, framework that helps you to write scalable test um, suits. The page object model is it itself a design pattern uh, that became really popular. It keeps your testing load clean and easy to maintain as you abstract all the information about the specific test away from the test itself. And that makes it really easy to extend um, functionality to a specific page and keep the test clean um, and reusable. So in an ideal world um, where you, let's say, redesign, just redesign the complete page, all you need to do is to change the selectors and some methods of the uh, page object model, and your tests can stay the same. Um, this really helps you uh, to scale out your test, in, uh, your test files and um, you know, make your test itself less brittle. Here's an example of how, can, how you can use the page object model in WebDAVO uh, using JavaScript's uh, getter functionalities. Um, which would then return an element, uh, and functions to do certain interactions with the page. This results in a really clean uh, test where you essentially just interact with the page object model instead of selectors or specific elements in itself. Right, a demo is worth more worth than 1,000 words. So let's jump into a couple of demos that I've prepared that show uh, what WebDevRo is capable of. 
And let's start with multi remote. Going back into my ID, um, I have an example folder for multi remote where I want to test a chat application um, that is demonstrating Socket.io. And in this test, um, where I, which I run with two Chrome browsers, um, I get the, I have the ability to call a certain command, like opening the website with um, on both browser at the same time, or just uh, run a command on one browser at a time, as you can see here. And this allows me to, you know, log in both of the uh, of the parties and enter their username and allow one browser to interact with the message of the other browsers. So you'll see that we log in into the Socket.io chat and someone will say, hey, my name is Edgar. And the other message tries to find out who that person is and uh, will say, hello, other person, how are you today? So if we want this, then um, test chat. We will see that there are two browsers spinning up. One is browser A, one is browser B. Says, hey, what's up? My name is Edgar. And the browser B say, hello, Edgar. How are you today? Another example, as I mentioned, is the WebRTC example, which I have here, um, where I set in some Chrome options to fake um, uh, the media stream. And then I just open a WebRTC channel and uh, see how that looks like. Again, two browsers spin up for my test. Um, they join a random channel. And that's about it. Going back to the slides, the next demo is performance testing. Last year, I really worked into how we can integrate performance testing that you have, uh, for instance, with Lighthouse or webpagetest.org into an actual automation script. And for that, we have, um, we have built a, a service, the DevTools service as I mentioned before, which has these capabilities now. Uh, so you can call a command called enable page uh, performance audits, and it will automatically uh, throttle the CPU and the network for you to kind of emulate a mobile device. And with that, you can create, uh, uh, have, you can receive performance metrics like, like first meaningful paint, first interactive of the speed index, or test the overall performance score. The DevTools service here uses Lighthouse under the hood uh, to get you all these metrics. So let's test that out. Um, actually, um, we should open our test page. It needs to be booted first. Oh, it's already there. Perfect. Uh, so we cannot just go and say, go into DevTools folder back and run the chat that we have with metrics. So what's happens here now is that it opens a browser with mobile capabilities. So the page load is much slower because it is, it's, run, it's running on a regular 3G connection. And now it takes, it does a performance, uh, it captures the performance of that page and allows me to assert against it. So as you can see here, without me doing anything, um, the the uh, first meaningful pain was at 3.7 seconds, and I expected it to be less than three seconds. Uh, the same was first interactive. And this made my overall performance score uh, to 78%, uh, which I expected to be at, at least above 92. Um, so this allows you to integrate performance, uh, Lighthouse uh, performance scores into your automation test. Uh, Next step is visual regression. Um, therefore, I have this demo. Um, as I mentioned before, you WebDriver provides an API tool service that you can just integrate by installing the WEO uh, API tool service um, NPM package. And then all you need to do is in your configuration, which I have here, say that I have an API tool service installed, and here's my API tools key, and it knows everything, what it needs to know about creating the screenshots and checking to it. So the service creates a new command called take snapshot, 
and it will take the snapshot of these two pages. So if we run this, npm one test local, it will run the visual test and the service automatically um, formats the window size and then opens Google and takes a snapshot as well as um, the, it makes a dome snapshot. And after entering it, it takes another screenshot on the second page um, to see if the result afterwards is the same. And I already see differences because I did not really clean up the baseline, but what you can see is that, you know, without having to deal with the Apply Tools API or anything, I can, you know, push up my test that I've just uh, run to Apply Tools automatically without doing anything, uh, which is really great. And last but not least, uh, is the watch mode. Um, WebDriver allows you to watch files as you work on them. So what you can see here is, uh, what you can think of is like you go to the office in the morning and you, you know, your, your first task of the day is to start working on end-to-end -end tests for your project. And uh, what you can do, you have a test project with a variety of with, with tests. And so what you can do in your project is just say, npm run npm run watch, which runs the run command with a dash dash watch um, parameter. And this will create all the tests. In this case, it's uh, these are headless tests in the source cloud, um, as I want to have these tests being really fast and return the results quickly. Um, I have these running with high concurrency uh, there. And you can see that it fairly runs quite quickly. And the nice part about the watch command is, is that it doesn't close down the session. It will keep the session open. So whenever you do a change, like a console lock, and you press save, it should rerun the test, um, essentially. Uh, let me see. This test is actually not running. Uh, if I do it here, there we go. It immediately runs the tests and gives you results. In this, in, um, in this case, a failure because the test has failed. Um, you can also you know, make a change in your overall application, and then it automatically runs all uh, the test files uh, for you. As you can see here, without having to respin the checkbox up, and it immediately gives you feedback about all your tests uh, in the second. And that's almost about it with the demos. Um, so as you may recently heard, we have released a new major version, which is version 6, uh, which is not that difficult to upgrade uh, compared to version 5, if you have to go through that. Um, the new version now uh, comes with the Chrome DevTools protocol embedded. Uh, we see that the Puppeteer project is getting stronger and stronger and supports more and more browsers. Uh, so with that, we want to leverage on that. And with the version 6, if you install WebDriver.io, you don't need to have a browser driver anymore to start testing on Chrome or Firefox nightly right away. We also embedded a new session library into the test runner project called expect-webdriver.io, which gives you all the nice assertion measures that we have with frameworks like Jest uh, in your hand uh, for end-to-end um, -end testing purposes, uh, where you have like a to be displayed com uh, assertion to make sure that the uh, element is displayed or not. And the assertion itself also are really uh, smart because they have specific weights and automatic, uh, yeah, specific automatic weights that help you uh, reduce the flakiness in your test. We improved the performance of the core packages um, in general. Uh, we reduced the, um, we increased the speed how elements can be fetched. We also reduced the bundle size and we want to prepare to allow WebTravel to run in the browser. And uh, the most important part about the version 6 release is that we dropped uh, support for Node version 8. And we announced that we want to keep version 5 um, a long-term uh, long -term supported version uh, because we know that a lot of people had to struggle to go through the upgrade and don't want to update again um, right away. 
what comes next? So we have a big roadmap ahead of us and we're really looking for anyone who's interested in helping us out here. There's a bunch of things that you can help us out and uh, support the project with. Uh, we are planning to build a fiddle application for WebDIRO where you can share your test snippets with other people uh, and allow that to run in that fiddle application. We're currently working on a better support for network stabbing and mocking. And you find the um, proposals for uh, these features uh, on GitHub, and they are already really exciting. Uh, one of the great things that we want to do is we, we allow, want to allow to make snapshots of the network request uh, so we can easily check if the right network request has been made or not. Then we want to simplify the bootstrap mechanism, allow you to not only configure your configuration file, but also create um, uh, some sample test files for you to get started. And of course, we're always looking for better documentation and um, uh, you know, um, examples for everyone to easier get started with WebDRL. And for you, to, the best way to get involved is to just go on the GitHub project page, uh, look through the issue list, and look for issues that are labeled with a uh, good first pick or um, uh, first timers only. These are really made for people that want to start working on WebDRL, and uh, they're really well explained. And don't hesitate if you have questions around solving that issue. Uh, we as collaborators would really like to help you, uh, help, you uh, help us out. With that said, this is the end of the first part of the workshop with the presentation. Um, if you have any questions on the presentation itself, uh, now is the time to ask these. Um, so I can go back into the slides or can show you specific examples. Uh, and if there are no questions, we would go forward to the actual workshop um, on the GitHub page. So does anyone have questions on the presentation or already on some of the things he was uh, that were in the hands-on material? I see there's so far no questions. So if you have questions, um, feel free to just, um, to just write them down in the chat. Um, we have a bunch of people watching the chat and uh, they can help you out and I can you know, show them specific things if they are unclear. Um, so for the second part of this workshop, let's go into um, the hands-on material. We have a bunch of chapters that kind of build on, on top of each other, um, where you start setting up an environment, then build your first automation script in standalone mode, uh, then move on to the test runner, include your own reporters and services, and so on, until some you know, more advanced stuff like uh, using the DevTools package or uh, doing visual regression testing. So let's start with the first chapter. The objective here is to get an environment running where you can use WebDRL. So <clears throat> for that, of course, you need Node.js installed. Um, I would recommend to create a new repository um, that we can do. Let me make this bigger and move this over. All right, so you can, let's just create a workshop folder. Oh, it's not existing. I thought I created that. It's there. There we go. So what you need to do with the first chapter is to get a driver um, from one of the uh, from the Chrome driver page, from the Edge driver page, where whatever browser you prefer, uh, start the driver and um, run a WebDriver script. So let me you know work through this. Um, so we need the driver essentially in the first place because uh, WebDriver pretty much just defines certain endpoints that you can that you can call 
um, or certain commands that you can call with your framework. And it, it leaves it up to the driver to actually execute that action in the browser. And this driver, which is you know, developed by the browser vendors, um, they, the browser vendors itself, they know exactly how to make this certain action happen. So this way, um, I, we go to the download page of the Chrome driver um, project. And we load the latest Chrome driver version for whatever Chrome you have installed. And you just unpack it, unzip it, and you, know, you move it into your path. Um, if you have Mac, um, make it globally available so it's easy for you to run it from every browser, from every environment, uh, directly where you're in. So I have a Chrome driver command available for me by just extracting um, Chrome driver and moving them in one of the directories where um, I keep all my custom binary files. Uh, so I have here binary files for Helm, for Gecko driver, uh, for Tiller, and for Chrome driver. So I have Chrome driver version 86. And so all I need to do is um, to start Chrome driver uh, with a custom port, uh, let's say standard on 444. Uh, which is not existing. Uh, there we go. Oh, this part is already used by something else, which I will clear up. There we go. So now, web driver is running. Uh, Chrome driver is running on port four 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 four, and I create now a second console that. I want to use to write my web driver script. Uh, okay. There we go. So I go into work, my workshop again, and I install WebDrive.io. Which should not take that much time. And again, always, if you have questions through the workshop in other chapters, don't, feel free to just put, uh, put them in the chat and we can, I can help you out. Um, so here we have a workshop, uh, we have install WebDriver. Let's write a simple script. Actually use my IDE here for, so have a new file called index or test.js uh, where I import WebDriver. I say remote. By getting the remote part uh, property, you can create the same session with multi remote by just using the multi remote property or function. So then I use I write an asynchronous function because I want to um, a self invoking asynchronous function um, because I want to use async await for creating um, all the um, to for running all the commands. So here I say my browser awaits a remote session. Uh, no, nope, that's wrong. Awaits a remote session. And as you can see here, we have TypeScript support. Um, well, we have general typing support if you use VS Code and similar IDs. Uh, but WebDriver also comes with TypeScript support definitions. Uh, so you can use TypeScript uh, if you want to. Uh, so my capabilities are. Uh, since I have Chrome driver running, it should be Chrome. So I can say Chrome. And that's all I need to create a remote session on my local machine. Then I can go ahead and say browser.ul. And I always like to use the json.org page as my guinea pig. And then I can say log me the title of that page. And at the end, return with uh, delete session. There we go. That should do the trick. Um, as you can see here, this is a self invoking asynchronous function. So I initiate the function and immediately call it. Um, and it's an asynchronous context. So I can use the weight in it. And if everything goes right. I can call the test.js file. And it now uses Chrome driver 
to open JSON.org really quickly and close it again. There we go. Um, yeah, and just to show you, I was wondering where, I think I have still a Chrome driver uh, process here not running. So let me find that one. No. So I've closed all my Chrome driver sessions. So we have no driver running now. And I can still run WebDriver without that driver because it now uses um, a Puppeteer under the hood and the DevTools package to run the same commands using the Chrome DevTools protocol. So here you see that Chrome launches with uh, some default flags, and then it detects the Chrome DevTools port and uses Puppeteer moving forward to just execute the same commands. The same would also work with um, uh, Firefox Nightly, and soon with the stable version of Firefox, which is exciting. OK, this is all I think we need to do for chapter one. Let's go to chapter two. This chapter is about writing an automation script that uses an actual application, in this case, the view to do MVC uh, app. And what we want to do is to run Chrome driver, as we've done before. And um, do, I think, create three items. Yeah, enter three items into the to-do list, uh, mark a second item as complete, and print out the amount of items left. Um, so let's work on this. We can reuse our existing, our ex existing script here. So what we do is we want to go to the to-do MVC app. Then um, let's do this. There we go. There are already three in there. Uh, let's clear them all. Clear. Um, actually, what are the items? I like to use the DevTools application to just find the items for me. Uh, so in this case, it looks like we have a class to-do list, and it contains various of to-dos. So let's fetch these. Um, Cons items equals uh, await uh, browser dot dollar dollar sign, which fetches multiple um, elements. The one dollar sign fetches one element. The first one it finds. The dollar dollar sign fetches multiple elements. Uh, so from the to-do list, we want to find all the to-dos that are in there. Uh, so this should give me an ar array of three elements. And um, one of the tasks was to click the second element. So what we can do is uh, we say await items, uh, the first element. Uh, so it's the second to do. And then we want to click on it. As you can see here, items uh, number one, uh, or the first um, entry of the items array contains an element object, which in itself has um, things, uh, commands registered that you can use to click to get the text or various other things. So we have we click on it, and then we want to see how many items are left. This is uh, hidden here. Uh, let's find this element. Uh, it's a list. The first uh, no. Where oh here to do count, to do count strong. Um, so what we do is after we clicked on it, we. Um, Create, define a new element that says await browser dot dollar sign um, to do count and in the strong element. And then we just log it out. I think that was the task. Print out exactly. Uh, so log out uh, items left, which is an element and an element, uh, as you can see here in the documentation. On the API, you see all the commands that are available for the browser and all the commands that are available for an element. And for to get the text of an element, we use the get text command here. Uh, so we can just copy that. So items left dot get text. Can we move that? And this should almost do it. Yet. Let me add a, a pause, an implicit pause in the middle or at the end so that we can see 
that actually everything is happening as expected. And that looks so far good to me. Let's try this out. So run the same script again. Um, it again runs on the DevTools package, but like I said, it doesn't, should not matter, uh, but it fails in this case. Uh, so let's, before we look into that, let's just use Chrome driver um, to, so I can use the web driver protocol where I expect everything to work. Uh, no, that error was intentionally. Okay, I think I've seen the problem. Uh, it says, cannot we click of undefined? Um, so if you have such an error, always check what you call it click on. And here uh, we see that items zero, uh, items number one is undefined. And I assume that the reason for that is that the elements, once I fetch them, have not been on the page yet. Um, that happens. Um, and to avoid that, it's always good if, you, if your app is dynamic and loads things from the back end, where you never know when the elements appear, to have an explicit uh, weight to it. Usually that happens automatically, but if you're, if you're dealing with multiple elements, uh, that is difficult to, re um, to you know, um, immediate, immediate uh, automatically. So what you do is you say, this first element, I want to first wait for it to exist until before I click on it. Uh, so you can close this, I think, and this as well, and this as well. And so now we run this again and check if it works. Uh, again, wait for this is undefined. Uh, this is a nice example. So there's apparently nothing in here. Um, so let's apparently uh, items zero will return nothing. Uh, so what we can do is we wait for the first element. Um, we've just fetched uh, the first element of it. Uh, so let's say first element browser dot dollar sign. So let's wait for the first element to exist. And then we fetch all the elements and click on the first one. There is 100% a more cleaner way to do this, um, but this is my solution that I will use for now. Let's see if that works. There we go. Okay, it finds, oh, okay. I, of course, cannot find any to do because I don't have any. Uh, I went one step ahead um, because we first have to enter three items. Uh, let's do this first then. Um, so we can remove this because once we entered items, uh, we should already see them. Um, so I need to find the enter input element, which is gonna be the new to do. And let's define that const new to do equals await new to do. We wait for the new to do to appear. So you know when we let we let the application you know do its thing and wait until the element is there. So we say wait for exist, and then we um, add a new value to it, and we can do. Two things, we can either add a value to the element and hit enter, or we can just use the keys element to just enter keys to the current focus element. Um, but what I will do is I say await new to do, add value, and I input two values, uh, to do number one. And the second one is enter. And WebDriver will recognize that this is a, a, a operation system um, input, uh, so enter. Uh, so it will not write enter out into the input field. It will add, it will just hit enter as a button. Um, so let's try this to, to do one, two, three. And then I should have three to do's, click on the first one, and then we'll see what happens. There we go. Three results. Okay. Uh, let's do another wait. I'm sure why it did not wait because 
I didn't did a pause there. Um, so it's always important. Every command is asynchronous. So you have to deal with async await if you use the standalone mode. If we later move to the web devil, um, support uh, to the web devil test runner, we can all remove the async awaits because this is handled by the test runner. So let's run this again finally with the result. Adding three to do's, clearing the second one up. Um, did not happen because I did not click on the um, on the bottom here on this check mark. Um, so in the to do, we have an input called toggle, which we need to click for that. So we we uh, accidentally clicked on the to do, but clicking on the to do will not change, uh, will not mark it as complete. What we need to do is we need to find the toggle. Uh, so we say, uh, find me the toggle within the first to do. Um, so we can chain element calls um, and like here. So that we find elements that are within that element. So here I want to find an element with the class toggle within the first element of the to-do. And then uh, toggle.click should do the trick. Let's see. There we go. And finally, results in two. And with that, we completed uh, the second chapter. There are some additional things that you can do here. Um, uh, for instance, running the same using the DevTools package, or even better, um, modifying the local storage um, to um, insert already existing to-dos into the application. Um, so with the com DevTools command, you have access to the local storage, which is the reason why when I reload, I already have these items here. Um, I can look into the DevTools uh, to mem not memory, application, uh, local storage, today on VC. You see here my uh, to-dos that are stored in this local storage, and you can imitate and mock the local storage um, with the DevTools protocol. And use, running on the DevTools automation protocol, you have already access uh, to these features. So you can try to run this and um, try it out for yourself and see uh, if you can um, get this running without having to enter in all three to-dos first. But we will move ahead. Uh, we have one hour left, uh, uh, half an hour left uh, in this session to go to chapter three. Does anyone has so far has questions? I still see the cry chat. Uh, anyone can report his progress where he is currently at. OK, um, we will then move on to the third chapter, where we introduce WDO Task Runner. And uh, for this chapter, we want to create a config file, um, a test directory for our end-to-end -end test files. Um, we want to port the test JS code that we have um, to you run in the test runner. Um, we want to make the code asynchronous, asynchronous and remove all the async awaits and use uh, our embedded assertion library and um, create a simple entry script uh, for our NPM package. So let's do that. Um, to get started with the web developer test runner, we need to install it. So the first thing we want to do is say npm install at wdao CLI. And this installs the CLI locally to our project. Make sure that you always, you should always install your uh, such a CLIs locally to avoid confusions with a probably global install, installed CLI tool that has the same name. Um, so you can still access this WDAO command uh, with the npx helper. So if you call npx uh, and WDAO help, we get the latest version of the CLI and some documentation around it. So to create a config file now, all we need to do is to call uh, npx WDAO and 
it will ask you, hey, um, you don't have a config file yet. Uh, do you want to create one? And I say, of course. So for this chapter, all we need to do is just you know, testing everything on my local machine. Um, running it on the cloud vendor uh, will come in a later chapter. So we say, I want to test on my local machine. I like Mocker to run my test in. I want to test. I want to run my test synchronous. Um, my tests are located in test stacks um, and so on. I currently don't have Babel or currently don't use TypeScript, so we can skip the compiler part. Um, I want to use the spec reporter, but there, are, as you can see, various of other reporters that you can use. Um, I want to use the Chrome driver service, um, so I can get rid of this Chrome driver and WDIO takes care of on creating the Chrome driver for me and start creating this Chrome driver instance for me. So my base URL is still the same, the to do MVC app. And it now installs all the packages that are necessary for this specific setup for me, which is good. And it automatically adds it to the package.json. That, there we go. Now we can run, essentially, WDL already. But before, uh, before we do that, let's create our test file, or let's port our test file, um, as we have set in the configuration wizard. Our tests are located in this directory. Uh, so what we do is to create a new folder, uh, say test. In that folder, we create a new one for specs. And in that, we want to move our test folder. So now we have uh, a script that is supposed to be a test. Um, so instead of importing WebDriver, we don't need to do that anymore because the test runner creates a session for it. Um, what we do is um, we just write test files from now on. Uh, let me comment this out. So describe to do MVC. And this describe block has, uh, no, a hook that opens for me the page where I want to go to. So browser.ul. And then I have no, an it block that uh, you know inserts three items. And for that, I will copy this part. So the advantage now is that the Chrome test runner by default runs the commands synchronous. It uses the fibers package um, to uh, plug into the node internals to make this the promise calls of every command a synchronous call, which you should not do for any other reason than that. Um, for testing, it's not important that the uh, you know the uh, event loop uh, stays still for a while because you're essentially testing and don't have a lot of user load. But uh, um, you should not do that for you know uh, serving web applications or any other um, um, Node.js applications. So we can remove the AC and the wait uh, for the commands. We can also move the browser dot for every dollar command that we write, because this dollar command is a global now as well. And so this makes the test makes even look simpler than before. No async, no async wait, and no long commands, just a dollar function as we had it years ago or still have with jQuery. So we're entering three items, and now we want to let's check immediately um, the amount of items because I expect now that always does that. Uh, it's expect now that all items, so all to dos, uh, to have. Actually, I don't know this one. Uh, let's look into our assertion library. Uh, Okay, to have children. There we go. Here's the assertion for this. Um, and it would be this assertion. Our element is 
the to do's, and we expect them to have children equals three. Uh, so let's write this part of the test. Uh, we have our config file. It has my capability Chrome. It has my base URL. So by having a base URL, I don't need to write this tool up this URL anymore, I can just say slash. Um, it sets some timeouts. It has its Chrome driver as a service set up. We use Mocker. We have a spec, sorry, a spec reporter and a bunch of other hooks that we can also use as part of the config file. All right. Uh, I think we have all we need to give it the first spin. So all we need to do now is calling npxwio Again, and by default, without any command, it runs the spec that you have. And fails um, for, OK, let's just write this down. Interesting. Um, that fails. Expected string to receive function. Uh, interesting. Uh, OK, it points to my tests. Here, described before. Okay, yeah, that was. I was always, you know, what's going on? Uh, apparently, my VS Code has imported this describe, which is not correct. Um, I'm sorry about that. So let's go ahead. All right, so it starts a to do MVC app, but not the right page. Um, this is not the right page. And you see it tries to find the new to-do item. It doesn't find it. But it still tries to try it multiple times before it ultimately ends up doing uh, failing on you. Uh, so actually, it, here you just see one call command. But uh, what happens in reality is that if uh, the command, uh, the element is not being found, um, it tries to tries it multiple times. We also wait for it here in the second line. So this happens anyway. Uh, let's see what our base URL is. It's this one. So essentially, this should work. Ah, I see it because it concatenates uh, the, the path is. Uh, we should, I think, write it with a dot. Otherwise, we will start with the to do MVC base page. So let's concatenate it this way and try this again. Now we are there. Um, I think that's uh, it's failing because oh, okay, it waits for three. Serialize is the same string. Okay, uh, let me see what we got back. It could not find um, the elements. So let's go back into the code. So this should be equal three. I guess we just modify this and say the length of all these elements should be three. Uh, I guess this way of asserting or matching the amount of elements doesn't work. Uh, so just say dot length to be three. And this should hopefully work. There we go. Now we can rewrite the rest of the steps. And we can say our second test is to uh, mark the second item as complete. And uh, here, we just copy this code. And comment it. So again, we remove the weights from it. Um, and so we have all items. We find the first item and click on that item. That still works like this. Uh, we can remove this one as well as this one, because dollar, dollar, dollar sign are globals. Um, and then we get the items left. And from that, get text. We should, out of this, we make an assertion. So we say expect items 
to have text. Now uh, let's double check this. Our assertion library has a matcher that is called to have text. It's right here. So all you need to put in the expect is the element and just to call to have spec on it. And that's about it. We can remove the rest of the code because we also not need to clean up the browser session that's happening by the test one as well. Let's run this. Okay. That was my bad. Um, we have to expect items left to have text too. Because right before we checked if it has no text, we want to make sure that the text says two. There we go. And there we go. But as you can see before, it tried to fetch the text of the element. We go back. Try to fetch the where was it? No, one more. Yeah, so it tried to fetch the text of the element multiple times. Um, and this is part of the advantage of using the WebDriver uh, assertion library. It has these um, retries in the, expect, uh, in the assertions, so the, which will remove the flakiness of your test if your elements, you know, if your element shows up later, or if the re-rendering of the element takes a bit of time. Um, okay, this with that we completed step section uh, chapter three. I think there's also an additional step for it, but I think so far it looks good, and we can move on to chapter four. Uh, before that, I will have a look into the chat. It seems it's still really very quiet there. Uh, we have still 35 minutes to go. Um, so let's just continue. Again, if you have questions um, to, uh, so if you have questions um, working on one of the chapter, please let me know in the chat. Um, let me wave to you. Um, so let me know and we can help you out. Um, there, so I will move to chapter four then. Um, here, we want to use reporters and services. Um, the task is to run Chrome Live as a service, which we already do automatically. Uh, we want to add the Allure reporter to, list, um, to the list to the reporters. Um, then we want to use the Allure CLI to generate the on-complete hook, um, to report in the on-complete hook. And we want to report uh, the Chrome driver logs into the logs directory, which is important if we want to figure out what's going on in uh, Chrome driver and see where Chrome driver struggled um, to you know, fetch elements and so on. So okay, let's first add the Allure reporter to our reporters list. What we do for that, what we need to do is, um, in, as I mentioned before, we have an install command that allows you to install all the reporters. And one of them is the Allure reporter. So we can just copy this out. Uh, oh, npx. <clears throat> this will install at WDO slash Allure reporter and automatically adds that Allure reporter to our reporters list, which is nice. So there we go. And we want to use the Allure CLI to generate the Allure report on in the OnComplete Hub. So the Allure reporter just captures the information from the test. To get the actual Allure HTML page, we need to do a little bit more. Um, so for that, we should look into the docs. And the docs have some information about the output here, which we can, um, I just will take this one um, to set a specific output here. Uh, so to apply properties to a reporter, we wrap this into an array and put in some options in there. 
And then it should use the command line tool. So we have the command line tool over here. And we need to call the generate command on it. As you can see here, um, let's skip that for now. Um, let's skip that task for now and uh, just run this first. Uh, what was the other task? Oh yeah, the Chrome driver logs into the logs directory. Uh, so let's check into the Chrome driver, Chrome driver documentation, which we have here. And for Chrome driver, we want to have our output here somewhere else. So let's check the services. Here's Chrome driver defined and we want to apply configurations on it. So the output here should be logs. And I want to actually run it verbose. So I see everything that's going on in the Chrome driver. Make this nice. There we go. I think we're good to go. Let's give it a try. Running the same command. You see the standard out is already much more as before. We see all the web driver commands as well as the Chrome DevTools command that web driver uh, the Chrome driver is sending to Chrome. So let's see what we got. We now have an Allure results with all the information from the test. And to generate in the logs, we have also the Chrome driver logs so that we, the thing that we had, we saw in, stand, in the standard out, we also have it now here. So we can exactly see when, um, for instance, the Chrome driver navigated to a specific page using the Chrome DevTools command page navigate. So in order to get the website for the Allure reporter, we should install, if we go back to the Allure reporter docs, uh, we need to have the, um, there we go, the CLI tool. So the CLI tool should be this. We install it, but without the minus G. And um, to generate the website, we can now call the allure command. Let's check if it's there. There we go. Uh, generate. And what it wants to see is, no. Let's go back into the docs. Generate, then the output here, which is allure results, and say, Allure open. Let's see what that does. Generates the Allure results and serves the Allure HTML report um, in my browser. So here we can now go through the suits. Um, we have the before all hook, the insert three items test, and the mark second item as complete. Uh, where we now see all the commands with their requests and responses. Um, we also get screenshots if we want to. Uh, the Lua documentation says um, where you can, you know, you can add custom things um, using the Lua reporter. You can also import it in your test to do specific things and enhance your reporting to it. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next chapter. Um, again, I've not fully created the, all the steps here. Uh, you can, you know, you don't want, if you don't want to say NPX Allure Generate, um, and if you want to have this as part of your um, test run, you can integrate um, this command here um, into um, the, an, into a, a hook, into an oncomplete hook. So whenever the test run completes, it automatically generates the HTML page for you. And you can serve it from your 
uh, AWS um, S3, uh, sorry, uh, S3 bucket or wherever you want to store the S3, uh, the yellow results. Let's move forward um, to the next chapter, chapter five. Now we want to build a custom reporter and custom services. And uh, for that, um, I recommend to look into the documentation for the um, custom commands and custom reporter. <clears throat> um, in there, you will see how these have to look like. And I will just create a sample custom reporter that helps me to understand the commands that have been executed. Um, to, so I move away a little bit from the hands-on workshop and just show you how to integrate a basic, um, a basic uh, custom reporter. Uh, let me remove Allure again because I don't need to have that anymore. And the service and Chrome drivers, there we go. Uh, this can stay. So I recommend um, if you want to build your custom reporters for your projects to you know, report every information from the test to anywhere else, um, literally, um, then a custom reporter is always good. So let's say we create such a custom reporter. Um, this custom reporter needs to be a class, um, as you see in the documentation. This example uses um, um, the <coughs> import statement, which is only available with the latest node, or if you use Babel. Um, so to run without Babel, which I don't have set up right now, I have to say module exports equals class um, custom reporter. You can name your reporter any way you want. What's important here is that you extend from the WDO base reporter. This is important because this base reporter ensures that you can listen to all the events that you can that you essentially want to listen to. So you import that base reporter. Um, like this. It should be already installed if you have a WDAO reporter somewhere in your dependencies. And then you can extend from it. And this gives you the ability to, you know, just listen immediately on um, on these events. And the way our reporters works is that they, you know, you can define various of reporter functions. Let's say um, on before command, which will help you to, um, which will help you to understand the command that is, is about to be executed. And let's make, let's say we want to find out how long every command, well, now let's, let's, let's just print out the command that's being executed. So in order to find out um, what parameters are, accepted, uh, are expected here, because that seems to be not documented, documented uh, we just go into the, um, into the project and we just search for it and I make myself a note that this should be better documented. We see the command here. If you use TypeScript, you would have already gotten this type support, so I would not have to check. But in this case, the command contains a method, an endpoint, a body, and a CID. So I'm just interested for the method which no, I'm interested in the body of the web driver command. So to see what's being sent over, um, that is being sent over to um, the web driver protocol, uh, to, the web, to the driver. Uh, so and unfortunately it's weird that I don't get the command name itself, but it's apparently that is not working here. So let's then just print out the body and integrate it to the uh, spec. So I just got a message in the chat. Uh, can you use web services in standalone mode? That's unfortunately not possible uh, because the test runner has all the logic to 
um, you know, connect the reporters to these events and emit these events. This is unfortunately not possible for WebDriver.io if you use it in standalone mode. Um, so if you write tests with reporters and services, always use the WS stand one and never really, never use the uh, a framework and build, you know, your WebDriver um, IO code around it because usually the WebDriver test framework takes a lot of things off from your shoulders. So like, for instance, initiating the session, creating reports for specific um, uh, session IDs, uh, so for specific browsers that run a specific spec, uh, spec file, which is really difficult to do if you, you know, use just Mocker to run your tests. So here, we can either now publish our package to NPM um, to provide this package, to provide the reporter to the community. Um, but what we do is we say custom reporter equals uh, require, and we require our custom reporter. And then all we need to do is to add it to the reporter list. And this should be it. So now it should print all the payload that is being sent to the Chrome driver as a report. So let's see, let's do this. Uh, calling npxwo again um, is not a constructor. Okay. So this usually means that I have integrated this in a one way. Let me see the docs. Okay. Let me see what I get back. Custom reporter. I exported module exports. Should be okay. Now, uh, this is a good thing about live coding and usually never works out. So this should be the class. There we go, custom reporter. Let's just for the sake of it, this should be actually enough. I don't have any options. It should, it should find that. Um, we can also just try something else in a second. Let's just see what custom reporter is. Maybe I have exported incorrectly. Uh, so let's see. Um, class extends. Oh, okay, yeah, I know what. Um, so the WDA reporter is um, <clears throat> is exported as a default. So if I use require, I need to set require at WDA reporter dot default. So I can remove this, and. This is about it. Now let's try it out. Okay, we have a lot of locks there that are not good. So let's say um, we say here it's silent. And we say the output year, is it defined here? We have an output year for, for Chrome driver, but not for WebDriver.io. So let's set this. Year name. So output saying putting setting output year to the current directory will create WDIO logs instead of uh, class uh, or you know clustering your uh, CLI your ten terminal. So now it's all a bit cleaner, and we see all the payload that happen from the reporter. And you see it's just a console log. If we now want to connect this information to the reporter, then we can modify and say this dot write instead of um, instead of console log. This will connect the information to the report output instead of just printing it out to the terminal. So if you want to have, if you want to put all your logs into a file, uh, you can only do this by using the write command. Um, so the reporting, the main reporter knows how to deal with this information. So now we have now we have a spec reporter. Uh, let's see, there was no config file created. Oh yeah, we have one config file here, uh, the WDAO00 custom reporter reporter. Uh, what a great name! And we see all these objects here. I can make this a little bit nicer by saying, uh, wait, 
with this, now it's better formatted. So with this, it is now better formatted. And we see all the payload that has, we use for every command to open the URL to find. Uh, we've had, used actually twice this selector. Um, how we entered the to do, and yeah, how we clicked on the toggle, and so on. You can do so much more uh, with the reporter and building up your information. And I would always, you know, recommend to extract all this information or extract all the reporters, uh, all the report up code away from the WDL config file so that you can just integrate you know, your custom reporter logic into a separated file and just integrate it by adding this to your reporters list. Given that we have, we have 20 minutes or even less than 20 minutes away from the end of the work of the session, um, can we move on to the next chapter? Um, let's see where we at here. Can just remove all this. Uh, let's move to chapter six. Again, if you're you know if you're stuck with this chapter, you always find the solution in the solution directory with all the results. Um, better than I have them done right now. But um, let's move to chapter six, uh, the source app integration. Um, so in this chapter, we want to run our test that is currently being run at locally. Um, on a cloud vendor without doing much work. Uh, so for that, we want to add the source service to integrate better um, and add more capabilities um, to create a broader test coverage. And as a bonus, we want to run the test in the EU data center instead of the US. So for that, I create a new config file. As I mentioned in my presentation, it's important that you split up the config file based on the environments that you want to run your tests in. Um, for if I want to, you know, for local testing, all I need is a Chrome browser to see if my application works. But in order to guarantee the test coverage on all the other browsers, I want to run this on Sauce Labs. Um, and for that, I create a custom configuration file. Here, I require our current configuration file, which is wio.conf, and then export.config, export a new config file that is based on the existing config file, but I add new things to it. One of the things is this, well, I modified the services. So now I don't want to use Chrome driver anymore. I want to use the source service. Uh, the add WDAO source service. Let's install that package real quick. Uh, so npm e install add WDAO source service. We have services for other vendors like browser stack, um, Appli tools, as well as testing, test object, and cross browser testing. I think so. Let me check. Uh, docs, here you have the list of all services. Um, the Lambda test service, I think it's also a cloud vendor. Um, testing bot and cross browser testing and uh, browser stack. All right, so we have the SaaS service installed. And now what we need to do is more capabilities. We overwrite that property and say capabilities. We now want to run on the Chrome. Continue on the Chrome. It's platform version. Uh, no platform name. Sorry, is uh, Windows ten, and the browser version is latest. And I want to have the same for Firefox. Um, uh, Microsoft Edge and Safari on Mac OS 10.30. Uh, 
Okay, uh, do I need to override anything else? Let me see. I think I we just need the spec reporter for this use case. So can we move this one? And that's it. The other com the other properties and configurations stay the same. And if you you know work like this where you have a base config, it is also you know it would make sense to also copy out the <clears throat> the properties that you only want to use for local testing into a wdio log local.conf.js. So for now we use have this source config and it would run the same test. We have the service integrated and we're good to go. So let me run this. And instead of calling the default config file, we now use the source config file. Um, there's an export. Yeah, this is not right. Should be module exports. No module, no exports or config. Let me see. Um, Exports.config, same as here. Um, okay, this, okay, um, this needs to be there. So in the main config file, we export the config property. So we also have to uh, use the named import uh, to get to this information. Um, there we go. We get an error, which is expected because a user key was not provided, which is important if we want to use source apps. Um, so what we need to do is provide our username, which we get from the, which we should always should receive from the environment. So in this case, it's process environment source username and process environment source access key which I have in my environment already. You can see here. If you don't have it, just export it, uh, say source username and then write something. But I already have it there, right there. So this looks good. Have the access key and username provide, provided. And uh, can try one this again. So it's at the same time, four browser sessions are being started. Let's see if, they, if the app works in all browsers the same way. So they all run in parallel right now. Chrome passes, Microsoft Edge passes. Let's wait for Firefox. I honestly doubt that they will pass, but we will see. They take definitely longer, which longer, which is not a good sign. We see now more log files here because we have now four workers. Uh, so we see a zero worker, worker one, two, and three. And for worker one, we can already see that the Firefox session is not being created um, for some reason. Um, Windows 10. And for the second, we have also issues starting Safari on this machine on macOS. Maybe the environment is wrong. So let's look into the platform configurator and get the right capabilities. It's not always easy to get them right. So that's why we have this configurator. And let's see. So we want to use WebDriver on a PC for Firefox on Windows 10. Let's see, Firefox latest and use a note code. So we need to have the browser version and Windows 10. So Firefox should look good. And if we want to use Safari on Mac, Catalina 1015 Safari latest. Um, I see, I think I see a problem. Now it's looking good. I think this had to be like this. And we can write this small. And so in order to, the uh, source app is currently still in transitioning between the JSONY protocol and the WebDriver protocol. And to ensure that we use the WebDriver protocol at all times, 
let's apply the source option, which is the the web driver ex capability extension, and this will tell source, hey, use the web driver protocol, please. So let's see. To fail, let's try this again. I hope this will now work out. If not, I will wave my hands and leave it as is. So. Firefox is starting, Chrome is already running, and we have also Safari now running, which is good. Let's ship back. We have one failure, um, which is here um, in the test just for Safari. Um, we can now you know, have a look into the job and see why this has been failed. Uh, Thanks to you, the spec report automatically detects if you run your tests on source labs. And if you do so, then you know it will print the job right there in the report. So now we can check what happened actually. And apparently there was no click happening, which is unfortunate, but something wrong with Safari. Could be either that Safari driver did not properly click on it or the application apparently does not work in Safari, which I know. But here we can check and see what's going on and where the browser is located. And we have all the logs in our hands. Another nice thing, nice thing is with the with WebDRL, it you can just switch the location of the data center by saying, I want to re use the region, the EU region. Well, let's remove two of the capabilities. Um, so by saying region EU, you automatically now run the test on the EU data center. Um, we can also say to our service, hey, I want to run things on source connect. So I say source connect true, and I want to my tunnel identifier to be workshop. So just by configuring this, WebDriverO and the service will do everything for you um, that needs to happen in order to download Source Connect now and to apply the tunnel identifier to the tunnel as well as to all your capabilities that you use. So let's um, take a look at the chat, but let's move on. Let's run these two capabilities. And we can already see if we look into the logs now, uh, is this the right one? Oh, it has not started. These are the old logs. It just started Source Connect now. I should be able to see that tunnel being opened. So, all the tests already have been closed down. Um, but in my logs, I can now see that the on-demand URL is now the EU central one. So automatically, WebDriver will switch that on-demand URL for you to connect to the EU data center. And just to show you that it was actually running over a tunnel, let's look onto my, it actually did not. <clears throat> so these two now should have been run over the source connect tunnel, which is important um, when you uh, want to test when your application is behind your network, your corporate network. I think we're at the end of our time. We have five minutes to go. It's the last chance for you all to have a last question or just let me know how far you got. If you, you know, have just, you know, um, if you just participated in what I have done, that's awesome as well, uh, because you can always go back. It's um, on GitHub. Uh, GitHub.com slash Christian Mines Broman slash Reptorio hands on. You can always go there and um, run these exam or section uh, chapters for yourself. If you have questions, don't hesitate to raise an issue or come to the Reptorio support channel that you can find at the bottom of our page um, right there. 
where we as contributor can help you out and you know um, help you to understand um, what's going on in your test. And when you apply with Devo to your project, we also can help you out. You know if you um, see any errors and similar things. So again, last opportunity to ask questions on the workshop before we close the session or on the presentation. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, I think the next chapters will be much more interesting where you go and um, move your application to use the to do uh, to, to the page object pattern. Uh, so your tests look like this, which looks much nicer than before. And um, then you integrate visual regression testing using Appy tools. And the last chapter will be about headless testing. Um, I see, can we see parallel execution? As we were already running this in parallel while we uh, we're running our tests on source apps as well as, I mean, we can do it locally um, just to give you an idea. So this is still, our main config is still configured to run locally. And instead of one browser, we define just two browsers. Just copy that. And if we run this uh, here, we should see two browsers spinning up. There we go. WebDriver automatically runs tests in parallel for you, uh, so you don't need to worry about that. Um, the network mock service, I can go into that um, for the last two minutes. Um, looking at the, currently it's not that easy, to be honest, uh, to use network mocking and stubbing. Um, there is an example for that in the example directory, actually. Uh, so let's go into the directory and go into examples, dev tools. And here you have an intercept. Actually, no, this is not using that. We have an intercept service that you can use. I think with the current one, it's not really possible to mock network requests. However, there is a proposal um, in place to implement that. And I'm super excited about this. I will show you that one in a second that allows you to uh, network mocking. Go here. It will allow you to mock network request with this new interface, with the network interface, where you can define a URL with a, a glob pattern. And you then just tell how it should return, if it's return a custom respond, or if it should be redirect to something, um, if it you know return once this stuff, uh, this object, and then with the next request, it should return something else. It, is, uh, it will be really uh, flexible for you to mock network requests, and it will be supported in Chrome, uh, Firefox Nightly, Microsoft Edge, as well as testing uh, running things on Source Labs. Um, so that will come up soon. Uh, that's what we are currently working on. Um, and there's more. Just check out our issue list. Uh, you know, if you want to help us contribute, uh, find something in the you know, roadmap, or I would recommend to just filter these, uh, the, um, the issues to first time as well. And with that, we are out of time. And thank you so much for participating in the workshop. And I see you online.